Serving as a United States flagship space vehicle from 1981 through 2011, the space shuttle carried over 135 missions delivering crews, satellites, and cargo into low Earth orbit, ushering humanity's first continuous presence in space. But did you know that for a handful of these missions, the space shuttle was used to carry out top secret missions? In this video, we'll pull back the layers and go into the details behind the shadowy secrets of NASA's involvement with foreign intelligence services like the CIA, the DoD, and the NRO. And this is Space Kite Engineering. If you haven't yet, please do consider subscribing as it really does help the channel. Little is known about these classified missions even 30 years later. One could imagine some super secretive and future spy missions happening up there like something out of a James Bond movie, but it's actually much, much more mundane. The job mostly involved deploying signal intercepting or radar imaging or general reconnaissance satellites into low Earth orbit. All the astronauts have sworn to secrecy and there are only generalized speculations of the overall mission profiles. The information presented in this video is my best attempts to summarize and quantify the info given what's publicly available out there. For some background, going all the way back to the 1960s, high altitude intelligence gathering has been critical to the United States foreign policy, such as in 1962 when President John F. Kennedy was briefed on classified U-2 spy plane images of Russian nuclear missile sites in Cuba. Shortly after being briefed on the images, JFK publicly announced a naval blockade. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. This allowed the U.S. to gain a better confidence of the strategic nuclear armament of Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So moving towards more technological advancement, what could be better than high-altitude reconnaissance? The answer? Spying from space. On September 6, 1961, a letter from the Deputy Secretary of Defense Roswell Kilpatrick to the Director of Central Intelligence Alan W. Dulles established the National Reconnaissance Office, otherwise known as the NRO with the core mission of synchronizing the space operations of the Air Force and the CIA. Not officially declassified until 1992, the NRO operated as a murky secret within the U.S. government, operating its own variants of operational centers, launch facilities, satellites, and even secret astronauts. Heck, even within Johnson Space Center, there was a DoD control room housed inside a secret facility on the third floor of Building 30. The NRO worked in the background in conjunction with NASA throughout most of its early spaceflight programs up until the beginning of the space shuttle program. At that moment, there was a shift in the relationships. The NRO identified an ability to align their objectives with those of the space shuttle program. Overall, over the next 30 years, they were able to influence and modify the shuttle design, create dedicated top secret missions, and even hand select their own crew members for shuttle missions. It's been known that the NRO was involved with the shuttle design. For instance, the NRO's largest spacecraft in the early 1970s, the bus-sized Hexagon Search Satellite ultimately determined the length of the shuttle's payload bay. Or since an estimated 35% of DoD missions required launching satellites into high Earth orbit, the NRO drove the push for the development of the Centaur upper stage rocket designed to be carried aloft inside the space shuttle. This would jettison items outside the shuttle into geosynchronous orbit. Even more critically, in January 1977, NASA and the DoD agreed on the specifics and managing of the operational shuttle fleet. It was eventually agreed that four orbiters would be built to meet a requirement for 560 flights between Florida and California during the first 11 years of shuttle operation. And that's roughly about 51 shuttles per year. And you know how I mentioned launches from Florida and California? Well, the NRO drove developments of a secondary shuttle launch site at Vandenberg Air Force Base for specifically high inclination launches. Space Launch Complex 6, SLC-6, pronounced as Slick 6, was extensively modified to support shuttle operations. Over 4 billion taxpayer dollars were spent on the modifications to the complex and the construction of the overall shuttle infrastructure. All in all, it was a massive waste too, because persistent site technical problems and other managerial failures led to a joint decision in 1989 by the Air Force and NASA to consolidate shuttle operations to just Kennedy Space Center, all before a single shuttle was ever launched from the facility. So far, we've covered how the NRO influenced NASA and the overall shuttle program operation. Now let's talk about the specific missions and the astronauts involved. 
Even before the first shuttle launch in 1979, the NRO had selected its first group of military payload specialists. According to an article by the Smithsonian, quote, one of the fundamental problems was how the two agencies perceived the payload specialists. NASA thought of them as outsiders, almost guests, while on the flip side, the payload specialists thought of their job as a way to help bridge the gulf between the military and civilian space agencies. Even with sour relations, the agencies still had to work together to complete the deployment of their secret payloads. Unlike traditional missions, there was a deep web of secrecy with these launches. Oftentimes, shuttle crews weren't even briefed on their payloads. Only the mission specialist, i.e. the implanted NRO military payload specialist, would have that intimate knowledge. Additionally, to support these crews, they were given a classified meeting room in the astronaut office at Johnson Space Center. They were also given a classified safe to store their documents and secret briefings, and even a classified phone with an unlisted phone number. All in all, there was a collective of 10 DoD launches throughout the entirety of the shuttle program. During the fourth ever shuttle launch, the crew of STS-4 deployed what was eventually declassified to be two sensors designed to test for missile detection from space. It was rumored that for the next two DoD missions, the crews of STS-51C and STS-51J deployed Cygnet satellites in support of the Signals Intelligence Program for the United States. However, all that is confirmed is both launches utilized an inertial upper stage booster to launch their respective DoD satellite into geosynchronous orbit. The next DoD launch occurred in 1988 with STS-27, and it is likely that the crew deployed a Lacrosse one a side-looking radar all-weather surveillance satellite. But according to multiple crew reports, one of the satellite's antenna dishes didn't open properly. To this day, NASA won't confirm if an EVA was performed using the manned maneuvering unit to repair the satellite or not. Conveniently, Hoot Gibson, one of the original co-investigators and pilots of the original manned maneuvering unit during STS-51L, was actually aboard the flight. So I would say draw your own conclusions there. The next two DoD missions occurred in 1989 with missions STS-28 and STS-33. They continued on this series of secret missions without much fanfare, deploying what is believed to be a series of imaging and signal satellites. For the 34th overall shuttle mission, STS-36 launched in 1990 from a record-setting 62-degree ground track, allowing astronauts to see the Arctic and Antarctic Circle for the first time ever. While the payload is still unknown, Aviation Week and Space Technology reported the payload's name was AFP-731 and weighed as much as 37,000 pounds. Some even believe it was an advanced photo reconnaissance satellite similar in size and shape to the Hubble Space Telescope. Concluding the program, the last three DoD missions took place throughout the early 90s. STS-38 launched in November of 1990, STS-39 launched in April of 91, and STS-53 launched in December of 92. Hidden in the details, I want to cover one interesting development of STS-39 specifically. It was the first unclassified Department of Defense dedicated space shuttle mission. And that's notable as the mission only had one singular payload that was listed as classified. But according to at least one crew member, mission specialist Blueford, quote, went up to the aft deck by himself while the rest of us pretended not to notice and allegedly launched a small classified satellite that's purpose is still unknown. Beginning in 1993, the NRO began winding down some of its programs and concluded its 30 years of involvement between itself and NASA. Even to this day, all crew members and support staff are bound to silence. But to give an impression of the level of work that was completed, according to an article by the Smithsonian, quote, In 1993, a person identified publicly only as a, quote, high-ranking intelligence officer traveled from Washington, D.C. to Johnson Space Center to meet with all of the astronauts who had flown on the secret shuttle missions and present them with a National Intelligence Achievement Medal. At that time, each astronaut was officially cleared to wear the medal in public and to acknowledge only the facts written on the citation. Maybe one day all of this info will eventually be declassified, and we can hear all the fascinating stories about the crews that flew on those missions. So if you like these type of videos, please do consider subscribing. Click on the little viewer to watch some of my other videos, and if you have any other suggestions or comments, be sure to let me know in the comments.